Okay, so this is Upgrading the Toolbox, NASA Resources to Support Air Quality Management. Okay, so the objectives of this webinar are for uh, me to provide the necessary information for you to begin accessing some NASA resources, and this will be to enhance your health and air quality applications. I'm going to introduce you to five different uh, NASA resources. The first one is, and this is in order of very easy to a little bit harder. Uh, the first is a user-friendly NASA visualization tool for satellite data. Uh, it's called WorldView. Uh, and the second one is a NASA website that I maintain. It has, it has lots of information for air quality and health managers. Uh, the third is a relatively new NASA GFCF uh, global Air Quality Forecast System, and then I'll discuss the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. Melanie is part of RSET, and she'll be able to answer your questions uh, concerning RSET. Uh, and then I'll just briefly end uh, with a little shout out to NASA HACAST, where you can actually work with uh, university and NASA scientists on your health and air quality applications. One thing that I want to point out is all the resources and data that I'll discuss today are free and publicly available to all. You just need a laptop to access them. And in fact, almost all of NASA data and resources are free and publicly available. Okay, so a lot of people don't know that NASA has an Earth observing system, a fleet of satellites of anywhere between 20 and 30 circling the Earth, observing the cryosphere, biosphere, lithosphere, uh, and the uh, atmosphere. And that includes air, air pollution. I've highlighted a few of these satellites that have useful data for health and air quality managers. The Aura satellite, which is toward the bottom there, uh, I'm actually project scientist for this mission, and it has the goals to monitor the ozone layer, the health of the ozone layer as well as to monitor some air pollutants like nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide. So I've been working with this data for a long time, the satellite launched in 2004. Uh, there are a couple of other satellites of note that are upcoming, Tempo and Maya, they're toward the top. Tempo is an instrument that measures NO2 and SO2 as well, uh, but it's going to be doing it um, 24 hours a day. So during daylight hours, you'll get information hourly on those pollutants. Currently, with the existing satellite suite, we only get one piece of information a day as the satellite passes overhead. Uh, and I'd like to point out Maya. It will be launched soon, and it is the first health-based NASA mission. The first. Uh, and what's so great about this are NASA scientists and engineers are actually working with health professionals around the world to make this data uh, from the satellite just to design it so that the data are very useful to the health community. There are a number of different uh, quantities that we can measure from space that are useful for health and air quality. Uh, there are a number of different quantities measured uh, that related to aerosols, such as aerosol optical depth, AOD, uh, and there's fire detection, among other things. Uh, and you can use this AOD to infer nose level particulate matter, less than 2.5 microns in diameter, uh, using atmospheric models. So that's frequently done. Uh, ozone, uh, we can actually measure ozone and have been doing that for many decades now. But the problem is, is we can't uh, measure or under, well, we cannot tease out the portion of ozone uh, right at nose level where we're breathing that the air quality communities are interested in uh, because there is the stratospheric ozone layer between uh, the satellite that's measuring ozone and the Earth's surface. So it's a very difficult problem, and I'm, I'm not sure that we can figure it out anytime soon. However, fortunately, we do have information on nitrogen dioxide. Uh, it's an ingredient necessary to produce ozone at the surface. Uh, it's the most straightforward to observe. Uh, the observations are wonderful, and it's an excellent tracer of combustion. So it's produced whenever you burn coal or gasoline, so it comes out of tailpipes and smokestacks. Carbon monoxide is another tracer of combustion, and there's been 
uh, uh, over a two decade record of carbon monoxide from one of the satellites called Terra. Sulfur dioxide, ammonia, and formaldehyde, they're a bit trickier. We can observe them from space, uh, but they're, the data are a little noisy, it's complicated. Uh, so, but we can use them in a number of useful ways, such as uh, tracking volcanic plumes that release sulfur dioxide, and that's used by the aviation industry. Uh, we can track other large sources of sulfur dioxide, such as when uh, coal is burned that has sulfur impurities. So you can see it from power plants, smelters, for instance. Ammonia gives us a great idea of uh, when fertilizer is being applied to fields around the world. Uh, this is an experimental product, and people are beginning to use it more frequently now as it becomes as it matures. Uh, formaldehyde is produced uh, directly from industry, but also it's uh, uh, emitted uh, or produced through natural processes. Uh, so for these three pollutants, the precision and accuracy is not suitable for most health studies, but the data sets are very useful. Uh, okay, surface ultraviolet radiation, that's not a pollutant, but the health community has been using it for several decades now uh, to study the effect of uh, surface UV radiation. There are a number of unique advantages of satellite data over, for instance, uh, surface monitoring ne networks like EPA's air quality system, AQS, and that is spatial coverage and being able to monitor how air pollution is changing over time. Here is one pollutant, nitrogen dioxide, from the Ozone Monitoring Instrument, or OMI. It's on the NASA Aura satellite. Uh, the data are gridded to 10 by 10 kilometers squared. And in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the uh, the the observations, an annual average from 2005, and the lower right, 2018. You can see very clearly that the satellite data show that environmental regulations in the U.S. are working for this point. The air is becoming uh, cleaner, nitrogen dioxide. So the satellite data are validated in a number of ways with independent observation. For example, uh, EPA's air quality system, if you're going to infer nose level concentrations of NO2. Uh, NASA has a number of validation campaigns as well. And if you're inferring emissions, say from power plants or cities, you can use other independent data sources, such as from the continuous emission monitoring system, the SEAM, validated. Okay, so. We live in a very exciting time when it comes to satellite technology. Uh, the technology is evolving and there's new satellites going up. Here's one example. So I just showed you images of OMI nitrogen dioxide and that uh, I plotted that on the left uh, of India. It's one day, November 28th, 2017. Uh, and I'm comparing this to a new satellite that was launched in 2017, OMI. Uh, and you can clearly see the difference. Propomi has superior capabilities in many ways to OMI, uh, and it shows. For instance, if you look at the Tropomi map, you can clearly see nitrogen dioxide coming from cities, uh, and if you look closely, even a few individual power plants. You can track the, the plumes as they uh, evolve and are transported downwind, and you can even see them looping in eddies. This is a game-changing data set. We haven't had such high resolution, temporal and spatial, before. Uh, just to give you another example, uh, when I finished graduate school in the late 1990s, uh, the first satellite data were coming from uh, GOM. The first satellite data of, of trace gas air pollutants were coming from a satellite called GOM. Uh, and uh, it had a very coarse footprint. Uh, 40 by 40 kilometers squared or larger than that. The next one that launched was OMI, Trope OMI, and then Tempo will launch soon. And you can see that the spatial footprint is improved or improving to where we have suburban uh, scale resolution. This is an example that shows you how Tempo in red will have very fine spatial resolution and have quite a few pixels even within uh, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C.
Okay, so uh, my goal for today is to convince you that you can use satellite data and global air quality forecast models in addition to low-cost portable sensors uh, and your regulatory quality stationary monitors to monitor air pollution in a more comprehensive way than you can with just regulatory quality stationary monitors. So I'm promoting an integrated approach to air, air pollution monitoring. Uh, each of these technologies has strengths and limitations, uh, and they need to be considered when integrating them into uh, your air quality monitoring system. Uh, as you can see, for instance, the low-cost portable sensors will give you information on street level and in near real time, and the satellite data will give you long-term trends, for instance. Uh, some people actually laugh about low-cost sensors and say they're just junk. Well, uh, maybe they're not so good today, but in 10 years, uh, they may be very good. They may, or the technology may have improved to such a degree that they're very common. Okay. so. I'm going to show you that there are five easy steps to begin accessing NASA data. The first is WorldView, this user-friendly visualization tool. The second one is uh, the air quality website that I maintain, chock full of information, and I'll go through some of that. Third, the NASA air quality forecast system, so you can check out air pollution forecasts in your favorite city around the world. Fourth, I'll just briefly mention RSET, the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. And again, um, Dr. Melanie Follett-Cook is, is here, and she can help answer questions on that program if you want to find out more. And then I'll just give a shout out to Haycast. Of course, Haycast is uh, hosting this webinar today. Okay, step one, worldview. So the web address is at the top of the screen. And this tool was developed by NASA's Earth Observing System Data and Information System, EOSDIS, and it provides the capability to browse through these uh, numerous NASA data sets on, on a number of topics uh, and to overlay them and then to download the data that you would like to have. Uh, they have topics on air quality, dust storms, severe storms, smoke plumes, vegetation, and other uh, Earth science issues. Uh, they have a, different, a number of different ways to access the data. You can browse pre-made images, uh, such as, as hazards and disasters or featured events, or you can uh, look through the data by scientific discipline. And of course, you can make your own maps. If you have any uh, questions about how to use Worldview, it's pretty user-friendly, but you can always take the Haycast tutorial. It's in the lower left-hand side of the screen. So let me just give you an example of uh, one of the featured events. So it's on the tab there uh, on the right-hand corner, so featured. And you can see that it has a number of pre-made plots for a number of different events. And I've circled the bushfires in Australia, which is a very recent event, wildfires in New South Wales that uh, were rather catastrophic. Uh, there are other uh, different events such as various hurricanes, cyclones, as well as um, even snowfall in southern Africa. So let's, so I'm going to go to the bushfires in Australia. Here's the first pre-made image that's there. Uh, the, the, the main image is what's called a true color image. It's what your eye sees, it's like a photograph taken from space. Uh, and you can clearly see smoke coming off of southeast Australia, New South Wales, moving out into the ocean. The red dots indicate uh, where satellites have detected fires were occurring. You can see they are highly concentrated around the thickest smoke. Uh, and if you look in the lower right-hand corner, it says step one of nine. Uh, there are actually nine images in this package and they show things like burn scars and other air pollutants. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can add your own layers of data in. You can plot your favorite pollutant uh, using the Add Layers button. Uh, and, the, and the ACAST tutorial worldview can step you through this process if you um, don't, aren't able to do it yourself. 
Here's an example of one of the pre-made plots, but you could do this yourself. You could also plot aerosol optical depth, an indicator of, of smoke, uh, yourself on this image. You can add that layer on top of the true color image. The reddest colors indicate where AOD is the uh, highest level. Uh, I don't have a color bar on here, but the highest level is, is in red. Uh, you can see that this plume has uh, a pulse of air pollution has moved off of Australia just north of New Zealand. So uh, step number two is the air quality website. The address is up there on, in the, in the uh, title. Uh, again, I maintain this website. Uh, and I've circled in red uh, the toolbar at the top. The pollutants tab has a lot of information on uh, what pollutants can be observed from space, such as nitrogen dioxide, um, the precursors of ozone, uh, particulate matter, and its precursors, such as sulfur dioxide. There's lots of information, ready-made images and animations. Uh, they're free for download. You just, if you use them in your own publications or presentations, just say courtesy of NASA, that's all you have to do. Uh, Impacts tab has an overview of how air pollution affects human health and agriculture. The resources tab has uh, listings of web tools for data access, has a few fact sheets on different topics, uh, a listing of relevant air quality websites, and a few outreach links. The sidebar has links to NASA programs, including the Food Security Office, because air pollution does uh, impact uh, crop yields, for instance. Uh, ozone uh, negatively affects the crop yield, whereas particulate matter in the atmosphere may uh, uh, actually improve it by diffusing sunlight. Uh, another program is the uh, NASA Air Quality Forecast System, RSET, ACAST, and then the Applied Sciences Office at NASA Headquarters. Okay, so under the Managers tab in the far right, uh, there's a number of different HACAST projects that I'm involved in or other people are involved in. Uh, and you can click on that link and go to those. I picked just one. And this was a project, a HACAST project, where air quality managers asked us to uh, show using satellite data that air quality has improved in the U.S. and to estimate the uh, the associated health improvements or the health benefits. So we worked with health professionals in HACAST to quantify this improvement in human health. Uh, I've circled in the left-hand screen uh, just a fact sheet that we developed. It's a four-page fact sheet that gives all, summarizes this information in plain language. Uh, and this was at the request of some air quality managers who wanted to show this to the public or maybe some senators on Capitol Hill or so on. Again, all these are free and publicly available. Okay, step number three, the NASA Global Air Quality Forecast System. So the NASA Global Modeling and Assimilation Office, GMAO, has uh, an Earth system model. And one option of the system is uh, an air quality forecast system. The model is made up of uh, a numerical weather prediction, state-of-the-art model, and it also has the GEOS chem chemistry package, so it has emissions and chemistry of major uh, atmospheric species like aerosols and trace gases. There are 250 chemical reactions, or species, and 725 chemical reactions in this model. Here are just three of the chemical species, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and fine particulate matter. If you have questions about this system, you can always ask me or ask Christoph Keller and Emma Nolan. They are in GMAO, and they are the brains and brawn of this system. You can uh, access the model output and download it and make your own plots if you wish. And so this uh, web link uh, has that information on data access. You can also use GMAO's Fluid Visualization Tool, uh, and I'll show you some examples of Fluid. It's a very powerful tool. I use it all the time. 
my, my own work, my own research. Here's an example of fluid. Uh, this is, so this, the screen shows that you just pick a pollutant of your choice, pick a world region in a forecast time, and you can make your own plots, such as surface PM2.5 over North America. You can zoom in even closer and go to the city level. Here's an example of uh, PM2.5 in New Delhi. So you can pick your pollutant, pick your world city, your mega city, your surface monitoring station, wherever, uh, and you can plot up your five-day forecast. This is called a, a datagram. And you can see PM2.5 is highest in the boundary layer where air pollution is being emitted uh, and less above the boundary layer. But you can see how it's evolving throughout the day. And what's powerful about this model is you can actually tag or color the PM2.5 by its chemical makeup. For instance, nitrate, sea salt, dust, organic and black carbon, sulfate, and organics. And you can see those here in this plot, middle plot. Uh, for instance, in New Delhi, it happens to be nitrates and uh, organic and black carbon, for instance. There's also some meteorological information there that's relevant uh, to the dispersion of air pollution. Now, fluid is currently undergoing further development, and hopefully we'll be able to add more species uh, to it and also have a point-and-click feature where you can pull up um, plots for any point on the Earth. Step number four, RSET, Applied Remote Sensing Training. Uh, go to this website, which is in the title. Uh, there are many, many, many useful uh, uh, web links there that gives you information on online trainings, uh, archive tutorials, and there's other resources. I can't emphasize how uh, excellent this uh, RSET program is. And in fact, you can even request an online training uh, I'm sorry, an in-person training where you can have our set personnel come to your facility and uh, and instruct you how to use satellite data on whatever topic that you're interested in, such as health and air quality um, and, and many other topics. I've just pulled out one of the other pages for their tools that are covered, and you can see that they cover uh, a wealth of different data tools uh, and model output. Okay, so step five, hey cast. I'm somewhere in that picture, I'm giving you a little clue. Uh, but uh, this has been a great team. I've enjoyed working with uh, many of them for the last decade. Uh, and what they do is these are people from different universities and different, uh, a few NASA facilities, and we work directly with stakeholders. We work with you directly, uh, health and air quality, people who have a range of expertise. Uh, Mine is generally observing air pollution from space, but other people, for instance, have uh, expertise in using satellite data for health calculations. We have people who have expertise in wildfires and so on. So just take a look at the, uh, the upcoming ACAST webinars and you'll be able to meet a lot of these people virtually. So that is my last slide. And now we will take some questions. 